This is Isaka's Page 2 Podcast. Thanks everybody for joining us today. I'm John Brandt, Isaka's Information Security Professional Practices Lead. Larry, thank you so much for joining me today to discuss your recently released article, Cyber Threat Intelligence as a Proactive Extension to Incident Response. For our viewers today, if you wouldn't mind just introducing yourself in a quick uh, summary of your experience, if you would. My okay. name is Larry Vashinsky. Um, I've been in the industry for like uh, 40 years already. And I started in 2000 in cybersecurity and all that, got uh, 12 certifications. I've written about 15 articles for the ISACA Journal. I reviewed some of the documents that isaka has got up on their webpage. And um, I've been in about a dozen different federal agencies and worked for like 10 different companies, just to give you some background. So my breadth of experience is fairly decent here. And during the time I've seen the industry grow from uh, the first uh, viruses to what we've got now, which is a very complicated environment. Well, that, you're more than qualified, and, and I want to thank you, you know, first and foremost, volunteers such as yourself that continue to contribute to the greater membership and, and the thought leadership across everybody who are certified and are uncertified. So, um, we couldn't do what we do without passionate folks like yourself. So it's been stated in certain sources, right, that threat intelligence is the practice of analyzing, integrating disjointed cyber and business operational data to extract evidence-based insights regarding an organization's unique threat landscape, right? And I, I think that's important just to position that no two organizations are the same size, structure, industry, or whatnot, which makes this uh, a very challenging uh, problem continually to manage the technical risk. In what ways do organizations use cyber threat intelligence today? There's, there's a lot of ways to use intelligence. Uh, originally, um, it was to try and look at your internal information in a way of uh, security logs, what's being tracked, as well as in-house activities to see what's going on with email. But uh, because of the environment we're in, they've had to expand that to look at external sources. And there's a variety of data feeds out there and organizations that will provide as a service all sorts of ways to get information together. Some of them will even do most of the work for you. So uh, there's there's a lot of things that can be done. Um, as you mentioned before, there's, uh, there's a variety of steps that are involved. And because there are different industries out there, you have to th uh, uh, customize your threat intelligent program to your organization. There's a variety of organizations out there. You got your financial, you got your school, you got your government. And there's, it's a big list uh, that you've got to cut, uh, cater for yourself. If you look into the industry as such, um, do some Googling, you'll see that cyber threat intelligence is all over the place because the threats are all over the place as well. Uh, they started with viruses, they went to email and cybersecurity awareness. And there's other sorts of uh, concerns that happen along the way. So, um, the process usually is starts with uh, planning, figuring out uh, what your method uh, or what your focus should be. And in the industry you're in, if it's a bank or the government, you're going to try and figure out what kind of threats are out there. And that'll lead you into what kind of services or feeds or information you need to gather to look at everything. Uh, lately, one of the drawbacks that you've run in, into is that since it's a fairly new industry, uh, as you can see in the article I wrote, uh, there is a lot of areas, challenges that haven't been resolved yet. So uh, it's up to us to, as a community, to work together to get those resolved here. Part of the problems I ran into when I was researching my article was the fact that uh, the challenges were so numerous. My article goes through a ton of them. Uh, I know we don't have a lot of time to go through everything in depth here, and I encourage everybody to go to the ISACA Journal website to see what's out there. There's a lot of approaches to resolving this in a way of models, as well as feeds and companies out there. So preparation is the first step. The second step is usually trying to uh, figure out and acquiring the, the information that you've decided that you need. 
Uh, one of the drawbacks that you run into is cost. Sometimes um, the feeds can range from like $1,500 to $10,000, depending on how many you're going to see it and where you're going to get it from. So that's one source. If you're going with software, I mean, uh, it, as a service, you've got to find the companies that can do that. You can Google that. And there are a lot of companies out there willing to help you out. So the step after getting all that is deciding uh, that's part of technology as well. If you're going to buy some tools in-house um, or if you're going to have someone else do it or if the feeds are going to come to the acquiring, the accumulation of the data is another challenge because there's so many different formats out there in the way some come as text, some come as commented limited files. The vendors out there, some of them use custom formats for their uh information and getting them all together uh, is one challenge. Uh, there are some companies out there, organizations that will help you. Um, they're usually focused by industries and they can share that information if you attend these things and give you some insight. One of the things that I haven't seen is the sharing of information. It's similar to the artificial intelligence situation like that's another growing industry that's going on is trying to figure out the machine language and the logic behind artificial intelligence to identify what you actually need and how to process it. The AI, artificial intelligence stuff, uh, grew because of the volume of the information being gathered and because there are so many threat actors out there attacking everybody that you've got to look for the information and the cloud environment seems to support this whole thing in a way of being able to expand the amount of storage for your information. And it even gets worse because of the volume grows over time. So there's got to be a cutoff of some sort. And trying to customize the information gathered into the cloud is one area that has to be managed properly. And uh, keeping the information, you've got privacy concerns, you've got European data protection concerns to worry about. So that's one area. The other area is that's part of the sharing component of it. And uh, management is another concern. They handle the budget for the most part. If you can get information free from these sharing organizations, that would help your cause. If you can make sure that you're gathering just the feeds and services that you as an organization need, that would be very helpful. And the other component behind that is the staffing issue. Since this is a fairly new industry, there are not a lot of people out there that are experts. And uh, because there's so many ways to gather the information, there's a learning curve involved. And sharing and getting everybody in the organization involved is another key trick. I've uh, proposed that the incident response team be cross-trained on this, because depending on the size of the organization, may, they may not be familiar with uh, uh, CTI, Cyber Threat Intelligence, or what it's all about, but they do help provide and do the investigation and the forensics. So cross-training the incident response teams and all those people is, is helpful and helps to keep the cost down if you can rely on your current people. So um, lately, the schools have been trying to train people on there. There's a lot of organizations out there that will provide training on CTI. You can Google those. I've mentioned them in my article if you want to go and find those out. I think I want to highlight a couple things that kind of correlate with this. You know, uh, Forrester, uh, one of their analysts recently wrote that on average firms are subscribing to five feeds. And, uh, and additionally, so I think, and again, I'm interested in your perspective when you were researching this, oftentimes people think about CTI being limited just from external sources. And that is one part of it, but that is not necessary. That's not also giving them the inside view as well, right? Because there's things that they need to be ascertaining and collecting off of existing systems to correlate and kind of paint a bigger picture, correct? That is correct. And part of the problems you got with some internal systems, you can have a, a gigantic organization and each department, if we call it that, or region can have their own way of gathering information because they have the budget to do that. And if you're trying to correlate that at the top level, uh, it can be difficult because the, the tools are going to have their custom formats that you're trying to put together. So that is a challenge. You know, I, I read your article and it, I tell you, and I encourage all of our viewers to make sure you go download that and look at it because there's just so much there. One of the things that really drew, you know, uh, 
that captured my interest here was of all the goals and objectives that you had written in there, a dwell time is arguably probably among the, the most critical out there. When we look at the fact of how long it takes from the time that a system is breached to the time that somebody finds it. Did you happen to come across anything that, uh, any reportings or anything that might have inferred that CTI is cutting down the dwell time and shrinking that of sorts? Yeah, I, I ran into a couple articles that they said that CTI can reduce the amount of research time by like down to 20% of what it used to be. And that's, that's an improvement, uh, but you've got to be on top of it. You've got to watch for it. You've got to try and make sure you've got the right information. Some of the sources that you get um, may not be current. They may be providing it uh, to you as stale, uh, like a day or two later, but the, already, the attack's already gone on. You got advanced persistent threats going on, all sorts of attack vectors at you. So yes, go ahead. Uh, additionally, you know, when we talk about, you know, one of the thing that plagues IT as a whole, right? Cyber is just we're inundated with data. And and, and what I'm just what I saw, um, it looks like that is a, an issue also plaguing CTI is that there are some folks that provide the service and they're just they're providing everything without any kind of validation. And you had talked about AI briefly and it, you know, and as we leverage more on machines to process, to do the first level uh, processing without any human interaction, you know, to me, then it becomes even more critical that the sources, regardless of what it is, and in this context, we're talking about cyber threat information, uh, intelligence, that that be good. Because if the data is bad, as an input, then the external usable stuff for enterprises is going to be flawed, correct? Correct. Uh, you mentioned bad data. And uh, in my article, I mentioned one of the things that I ran into during my research was that some people that provide the data may not be honest. They may be trying to poison the well by giving you bad information. And in, uh, people should be, whoever is gathering the data, should have some sort of vetting to make sure that the information is current and accurate. So that, that's a key issue that um, my research un uncovered is the fact that people are poisoning the information just to throw you off. Yeah, you know, and it, it speaks to the greater issue. And from my perspective, and, and it's kind of hard to talk about anything within cybersecurity that doesn't have some kind of... Um, human capital impact, right? You talked about, um, first of all, having enough people to do it, having people, the, the right people potentially, or upskilling them. And as we, without a lack of a standard out there, we're, we're continuing, at least this is one guy's opinion here, we're continuing to move down this road of, very, of more vendor proprietary type formats, which is only going to complicate the, our ability to to train folks and, and get them qualified to empower and help their enterprises. Would you agree with that assessment? Yeah, that's been recognized in the, the CTI uh, environment uh, recently. And one of the organizations in Europe, the ANISA, which is European uh, uh, Network uh, Association, they've put together work groups to try and st provide standards to for the interaction of, of these protocols and sources. So there should be uh, a platform out there to take those. If not, some vendors should be providing software that can convert formats from one to the other. Uh, right now, some of the feeds that you're seeing, they've got a limited number of formats. Um, I proposed in my article that this be expanded um, one way or another, either the vendor put more format options in the way of providing feeds or some vendors providing some sort of software to convert them as they go here. Uh, but the issue is if you don't have the direct feed, if you got to go through a software program to convert that, that slows the whole process down. But it's a lot better than uh, not being able to get the information you need. You know, as I read your article, you know, we have all the, the we continue to get these great, they're, they're promising features and capabilities out to enterprises. You know, I can't help but always come back to this fact of, 
your smaller to medium enterprises are really disadvantaged, right? Like, because they already have fewer resources. And, and while this is, it's obviously beneficial, um, it, it gets, you know, there's this question of, I, I think arguably we're still very reactive as an industry. What do you think? Yes, we're still in reaction mode. Uh, part of the problem that we've run into is that most of the stuff that's out there that's available to us is defensive in nature. Uh, offense is on an international level, and that's restricted to the uh, people that are, are part of like the UN. They've got an organization that's working with uh, the vendors and the governments to try and attack these. But uh, there's weaknesses. Uh, a lot of the uh, bad actors out there are in places you can't get to. So for the most part, we're in defensive uh, mode. We can only look at the reports we receive, the feeds, our internal logs, and stuff of that nature. Some of the CTI initiatives that I've seen are like vendors trying to figure out what's out there. They're looking at volume statistics and locations where the, the bad things are happening. And I propose that uh, they work better together to try and resolve these issues. You know, it's been reported that uh, that biz, that companies are failing to get some utility out of uh, out of CTI, and uh, you know, so obviously, one of the challenges historically up to now, right, was that enterprises were making investments in cybersecurity, and uh, up until a few years ago, it was still very prominent that when they made an investment in any capability to move away from it was very difficult, right? Because maybe it no longer met your need. I think that zero trust strategies are largely addressing that because it's giving enterprises the opportunity to basically revisit all components of their InfoSec program as a whole. Um, but for those that are, that are, that are either haven't gotten on board or are only using maybe one or two feeds that are out there. What are the real benefits? You know, if you could just name off, I don't know, like, you know, three, uh, three or four, you know, that you think are just probably the stronger business case supporting elements to, to sell executive leadership. To sell leadership. Um, You've got one of the things is getting the information sooner so they can identify the threats and, uh, put their investments where they need to be. By investments, I mean their budget and uh, the tools or resources, the people that they need to fight this. Um, there's gotta be uh, adequate communication to management so that they can see what's happening more real time and they can react better. Uh, with big organizations, there's big risk because uh, the whole organization's at, at risk there. So aside from uh, that is, uh, Decision-making has to, to be gained. One of the other things that you got going on there is some organizations will track the criminal entities. Um, I don't know if anybody's done this or not. I do this every so often is, is I do a search on the web for takedowns and some of the specialized, uh, uh, what do you call it, people that publish magazines and websites have done research on what's going right out there. Um, I produced an article about takedowns a little while ago and it has uh, a, a short list of some of the takedowns going on there. Recently in the news, uh, the Washington Post, I get that, uh, there was an article that uh, the government, along with some Euro European organizations, tracked down the makers of the ransomware from Revel. They took down most of the people involved. And that was good news. However, if you do some more research, you'll find out there's at least 30 versions of the ransomware out there. Uh, federal government of the United States has uh, looked at how this is handled here, and they are trying to provide information to all those at, at, uh, available. So CTI can help uh, with that uh, in the way of cooperation between the foreign governments. Um, in some cases, CTI can uncover fraud and identity theft within an organization if, if they know how to do that. Uh, there's a variety of uh, ways to attack this, and uh, the more you know, the better. Um, the training that's out there, I encourage everybody, if you're looking into this field, to 
continue your search for training and hopefully the market will get better out there in the way of interfaces. And um, since it's I, in my article shows you it's new, there's a ton of challenges out there. I propose some recommendations. So hopefully um, that can happen. You know, I saw in your article, you, you spent some time in information sharing. And it's just so important, right? Because it, there's been just widespread discrepancy, at least here in the United States, right? There's There's been this almost this standoff for a while where, you know, the government wanted industry to share with them, but they weren't reciprocating. I'm aware, you know, there is some le legislation that, you know, is in the works. There is some, I think, some better uh interagency collaborative work. But at the end of the day, enterprises, you know, especially if they have boards, they're, they're, you know, they're answered to the board or if they're shareholders, there's potentially answering them. So, you know, I'm sure that there's still a little bit of, in, you know, angst about sharing stuff. And if you do making sure that it's sanitized, um, and that kind of leads me to my next point here is you had, um, you had uh, mentioned um, ISACs and ISOs, right? So information sharing and analysis centers and organizations and, uh, and Forrester also highlighted, you know, the latter of that as being a very good secondary source beyond what you get internal to your, to your organization, because that's the best intelligence. Um, However, using, uh, leveraging uh, the ISOs there because them being aligned to specific um, industries, let's say financial or, or whatnot, at least it's giving you uh, some indicator, indications and warnings, if you will, of what is specifically tag, uh, targeting you and to kind of narrow your search. You have anything you'd like to add to that? Yeah, you are correct on all that. Um... The organizations that you can partner with, share the information is some of the uh, attendees are like in read-only mode. They're, they're only there to listen and not contribute. That's partly because of the policy within the organization that they can't share their information. It's sensitive or classified. So they need to be involved in that. Uh, I encourage those organizations to share information in the way of processes. One of the things I think I mentioned in the article is that um, – Sometimes it's difficult to figure out what to do. If you've got an artificial intelligence set up and you got machine language to set up, there could be a sharing or a standardized uh, logic behind trying to use AI to find your threats and everything. And that needs to be shared as opposed to everybody struggling at the same time. And I think it would help speed the process up if that sharing was in place. So um, I, one of the other things that these organizations can tell you about is if there's uh, new botnet attacks going on there, if there's new malware being developed and how they're gonna be used. Uh, these organizations could be at the front line, uh, a couple of the members that could share this information and help the whole industry and the organizations as a whole. So I, I am a proponent of people going and joining these uh, partnership, these organizations. So uh, you can do a search on the web to find the names and the ones appropriate for your organization. Yeah, I, I, I would second that. I, I think that the um, one of the things that just rings true is uh, we, we can't go it alone in this industry, right? Like it, um, some have tried, they've not done well. Collaborative environments have, have worked. Uh, you know, they continue to, to pay dividends. Um, uh, however, you know, like any other uh, communication type thing, you know, the person sharing is going to want to always make, you know, it, it, there's some vested interest to see that they're getting something in return. Um, you know, you, you had talked about different challenges that are out there, um, information sharing, you know, um, the planning to me is something that like anything else instead of just running out and going to get a CTI feed to really take a second and evaluate what the needs are, right? Like, uh, I, I think that at this point, as we get right, you know, we're running uh, um, a little long here in this podcast, what can we tell our viewers? Like when they are evaluating, or let's say maybe they only have, you know, one feed, what can they do now to be more deliberate with the current feed or, or before they move forward to kind of look at this holistically? 
Okay, one good source is the Osaka uh, website. There's blogs out there where you can post questions and ask for advice. And there's other organizations uh, when you do a search and like the professional vendors out there. And when you go to their website, sometimes they got chat bots that come out and uh, try and volunteer for help here. So uh, doing this research, um, asking your fellow uh, ISACA members what they think, because there's experts within our organization here, on how they can do and go into the vendor sites. That's part of the research process to see what's out there and to focus it. These uh, sharing organizations are great. You can reach out to them to see what they can say as well. They've got their own websites and uh, get the recommendations. I think that initial research is very important. Uh, that's part of the planning and approaching it. They can probably provide recommendations and they can give you the names of the vendors, names of the products. There's even articles on a variety of products out there that work on different platforms, depending on what's out there. And the costs vary. But uh, this is a critical component is planning all this out, doing your research ahead of time. And uh, management needs to be involved to see, uh, to manage the costs and the staffing and all this stuff to see if it's out of hand. And as you mentioned earlier, the smaller companies are at a disadvantage because they don't have the, the funding uh, or possibly the staffing to do this type of work. So having them be members of the sharing organizations is, is a great uh, step in, forward for them. You know, I really think that uh, your final words are really important. I, I, you know, and this is not a knock on any vendor out there because there's there's some vendors that are doing uh, they're doing some good work and some of them are doing better than others. Um, but it is incumbent upon an enterprise in, in, in there. And if you're in a, uh, a purchasing re uh, authority or recommendation role to really kind of do that pre that discovery work that you alluded to uh, before you go to, to the vendor, right? Because they're the, the truth of the matter is every vendor has something very specific that they're offering you. And while there is some, this increase in, in some tailoring the things to your specific use case, that's not really prominent. Um, and so you need to make sure that what it is that they're often does align very well. You can find the link to Larry's article, Cyber Threat Intelligence as a Proactive Extension to Incident Response below. Larry, I wanna thank you again for taking the time to chat with me. I'm John Brandt. Thank you for tuning in. Thanks for having me. Thank you for joining us today for this episode of Page to Podcast. We hope you enjoyed this episode. 